Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for getting back on time. Uh, my name's Rob Stoneman. I'm the vice chair of the ICN UK Peatland Programme, founder, member of the programme. I'm really honoured to be still involved after all these years. I'm also director of landscape recovery at the Wildlife Trust involved in, well, not surprisingly, landscape recovery, green finance, uh, keystone species and things like that. So we're going to talk very much uh, in this afternoon session about funding sustainable peatlands or sustainable funding for peatlands and how do we meet our ambitions. And we talked a little bit in the last session about the importance of funding. There's a lot more funding out there than there has been in the past, but nevertheless, sometimes that funding isn't as always as easy to get at as it could be. And certainly in the terms of the practitioner community, having um, helped to set up the Yorkshire Peat Partnership, so a bit of experience from me, um, the, the big issue in terms of capacity is that long-term stable funding that allows you to build that capacity up. So we still haven't really cracked that. We still creak from one grant to the next, to the next, to the next, although it's much better than it used to be, having said that. So we've got three brilliant speakers uh, this afternoon. So we've got Gary Coggins, we've got Caleb... Wheeler and, uh, and Rene from the Peatland team. Um, so I'm going to, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to switch straight across to Gary. Okay, thanks everybody. It's great to be here and uh, to come over from Ireland and see all the great work that's going on around other areas around the UK as well. So um, I just want to present on results-based payment schemes and our experiences there from Ireland where we've like over 30 years of experience in the delivery of results-based payment schemes. But <laughs> In particular, looking at them now at this stage in terms of the results-based payment schemes being a mechanism for delivering large-scale restoration and conservation and across the long term, hopefully, as well, and where we're at in Ireland there. I will say from the off that I'm a social scientist, not, not an ecologist like maybe a lot of people here, so maybe I might have a different perspective than some, but I think uh, everybody is moving towards this multidisciplinary uh, teams as well, so I think it's important to have that element, and I think it's a great um, evolvement of the restoration, conservation, kind of the whole area is, is bringing in all these different skill sets. So I'm coming from a project, a uh, life integrated project, Wild Atlantic Nature. Uh, it's a big long project, nine years, with 20 million kind of start off funding, but their focus is on blanket bog, special areas of conservation in Ireland. So there's 35 sites come under the project, uh, covering a total of about 260,000 hectares. Uh, for us, about 80% of that land is privately owned and actively farmed land. So if we want to make a big change in terms of restoration conservation of peatlands in Ireland, we really have to put the farmer at the center of what we do and the local community. So we really work to try and consider the impact on the farmer, work with them. I mean. A lot of projects in the past might have targeted state lands and low-hanging fruit, and it's a lot easier in a way, but it'll only get you so far. Our take on it would be there's a lot of money around at the minute for conservation and restoration, and so let's make the most of that while it's available. You can always go back and do state lands to meet, uh, for us, EU targets again, and uh, when there's less money available, etc. So everything we do in the project, we're looking at, okay, we, we try to test it at smaller scale, and we're looking, how can we build capacity here? How can we deliver this at scale? If we try something for 10 people, will it work for 1,000 people? Will it work for 10,000 people? If it's for 10 hectares, will it work for 10,000 hectares? So some of the issues we're grappling with, it's the same, I think, the world over, and um, we've heard a lot about policy, and a lot of policymakers talked this morning, and a lot of the the, the um, barriers to conservation restoration, their admin, their IT, their policy barriers. We actually know how to go out and do the restoration on the ground. The technical delivery, most of that knowledge is there, how to do it. But we run into all these admin, IT, data, um, policy barriers. And we've got many different land use policies which often are, are either not aligned or even pulling in opposite directions or incentivizing different behaviors. So we've got water policy, biodiversity policy, climate policy, agriculture policy, we've habitats directive, etc. And they're often delivering different messages for landowners. You should do this, you shouldn't do that for one or the other. So the landowner is left, you know, often, often confused and, and the, the result is usually damage on the ground. So all our trends in all these areas are deteriorating. So 
you know, it's great. You can stand up and talk about a brilliant project and, you know, 100 hectares restoration here, there, or other where, but the most important thing is to slow the rate of decline for us at the minute. All our trends are going the wrong way. We need to look at, well, what's causing that decline in, in these trends, and then we've got to plug the gap, put, the, put the, the plug hole in the sink first to stop that deterioration before also delivering restoration, but we cannot be, we cannot be going backwards at the same time. So for us in the project, this is the kind of positionality that we would see ourselves. Our objective is to deliver the high quality habitats, but they've got to be sensitive to the local context. It's got to fit to context. We would say that it's got to deliver two things. It's got to work, one, for the environment. We are an environmental project, but it's also got to deliver for the farmer, the landowner, the local community. And if you don't have that double benefit of the environment and the social benefit, then it just will not work. You might have short-term environmental gains, but they won't last if you don't also have the social benefit. If you've got the social benefit without the environmental benefit, you end up with you know, increased damage on the ground. And a lot of our agri-environment schemes in the past were delivered to give farmers as much money as they could get for doing the least amount possible. And that's what the farm organizations lobbied for, etc. And that's what happened. It was flat rate payments for everybody. You got the same regardless of what you were delivering. It, it, it's crazy when you think about it. You know, if you go into a, a garage to buy a car, it's not the same price for every car. The more, the more you pay, the better quality you get, etc. So we look at, at aligning all different policies, so land use policies, but also things like energy policy that you think, well, what has energy policy got to do with it? But when you're dealing with something like peat cutting and special areas of conservation for heating homes, you know, then your energy policy starts to come into play. Your social policy, if you consider the welfare state and the taxation regimes, etc., and how that impacts on land use. So if we look at all those policies and then we start to think, well, what are the practices that are at, pl at play in these different areas? What do we see in terms of farming, forestry, tourism, etc.? And how is policy supporting these practices or otherwise, or incentivizing a, a shift away or a transition or whatever? And then if you consider the local place, the nature, the environment, the communities, the culture, and how the practices shape the local environment, and how the area where you live and the environment influences the type of practices that are, are undertaken in that area. And then we tie in the policy and how that links as well. So it all gets very complicated, of course, but it is, it is complicated, and complex problems need complex solutions as well. So we would kind of consider all these different aspects. And then building on 30 years of experience in Ireland with successful agri-environment programs, often you know, R&D, small scale stuff, but we know what the ingredients are to deliver a good agri-environment program that works for nature and that works for communities. Which leads us down the road of results-based payments. So we piloted a hybrid uh, results-based program where farmers are paid agri-environment payments that are directly related to, e to the ecological quality of the land. So the more, in terms of ecosystem services that you deliver, the more you get paid. So the score goes up as the ec ecological or environmental quality goes up. So a scorecard's used to determine the ecological quality. It captures water quality, biodiversity, climate regulation, etc. It's very intuitive, simple to use. A farmer can, can use a scorecard themselves with about 20 minutes training if you go out and you walk their land with them but it's underpinned by very robust scientific evidence that if you get a high score on this scorecard, you are delivering a high level of ecosystem services. So there's no arguments in terms of taxpayer, well, where is our money going, et cetera. It's also very clear for the farmer in terms of the, the ecological condition of their land, but also what they need to do to improve it. They can identify the threats and pressures. They say, okay, I got a low score on a piece of land. What do I do to improve it? You say, well, you go to your scorecard, you look, where did you not get full marks? That's your land management tool. So it's very intuitive straight away for the farmer. So it's aligning these policies in this one kind of system. So water, biodiversity, climate in particular. Um, this idea, just go through some of the key principles, but the idea of a whole farm approach is essential. So the farmer doesn't pick or choose what lands to bring into the program and bring in the kind of marginal lands and then, you know, keep intensive agriculture on the other lands and maybe uh, impact in water quality or whatever it may be. So farm systems in Ireland and probably the same here, if you've got peatland, you've also got some grassland as well, sometimes some woodland. So we would have scorecards for peatland, grassland, woodland. We pay the same rate across them all. So you don't want to incentivize the destruction of one habitat for the creation of another by paying more. So when the farmer comes in the program, the whole farm comes in. They cannot pick and choose of what, what to bring in. 
Also, we target at the landscape level, so we look at the special area conservation plus the water catchment area as well, and then once the farm is inside, all lands inside that red line then qualify to be part of it. So you can target the whole catchment rather than one farmer doing something and then over the fence another farmer, you know, boom spraying or whatever and, and, and creating problems for water quality. So this kind of landscape level uh, targeting is very important. Also, in terms of the payments, uh, two things here. One, the digressive payment system and the area banding as well, important principles. Um, otherwise, you're going to blow the budget. Uh, the big farmer is going to swallow up the whole budget and you incentivize a land grab because you can make loads of money if you've got loads of land. So for us, we paid a, a top rate. We don't pay for less than four because baseline conditionality should, you know, we, we deliver this pilot on top of other existing agri-environment schemes. So, um, we, we uh, don't pay for under four, they're delivered elsewhere, but the first 30 hectares is paid on a top rate because the average farm size in our target area is 30 hectares, so it's a level playing field for everybody. But we pay on every hectare at two different rates. If you get a low score for whatever reason, we've got a supporting actions budget, a separate budget to deliver the restoration actions to bring up that score. So everything stays in the farmer's control. So we're rewarding the good quality, but incentivizing the improvement of the poor quality and providing the financial technical supports there. So things like water table management and, and what have you. We've a list of about 200 actions that we will, we will fund, all underpinned with a strong communication dissemination training program for farmers so everybody understands what the model is about. You get buy-in from, there's the EU commissioner for the environment over having a look, uh, here's our minister, and here's some farmers, uh, et cetera. So everybody top to bottom is on the same page. So we delivered for two years for 823 farmers the program. We paid over three million directly to farmers in payments, um, over 100 restoration actions, and all the while we were building towards the CAP strategic plan, the Common Agricultural Strategic Plan to see can we deliver this under the CAP. So now in Ireland from 2023, there are 20,000 farmers under this results-based type model in Ireland. So now we've got a massive implementation mechanism for delivering conservation restoration actions. 85% of our Natura 2000 network comes under there. So farmers in the next few weeks are gonna get letters out saying, here's the ecological score of your land. Here's a report of what it's about. So there's a flood of demand about to come for restoration activities. We're getting daily phone calls from farmers need to deal with this, that, the other, can you help, et cetera. So all the ingredients are there. Of course, what we need now is the capacity to deliver that. So we're trying now to build on top of that common agriculture policy program in provision of advice, in bringing in outside funds to deliver larger projects that cannot be funded through the cap um, to development of restoration plans, demonstration farms, et cetera. Um, and then we're building locally, local capacity for delivering the actions so the farmers and the local community can do the restoration works in their own area, provides employment, keeps skills, um, everything in the local area for lo long-term restoration. And I'd say I'm well out of time. Well, I'm around for the next two days if there's more, if there's more <laughs> questions. Thank you very much, Gary. That was a great start to this session. And it did remind me to think about, you know, when we talk about sustainable financing, what are we actually talking about? Well, normally, if you set up a business, you make your money from revenues. And we know that many of the benefits of peatlands are non-marketable, so we have to look at other ways of raising money. And typically, we've done that through grants. There's only so far you can go with that. Obviously, the big agri-environment budgets, we've had a fantastic example there from Ireland about how to make them work. Maybe we could think about that in the UK as well. Um, private funding um, is also important. So we're going to move on to that private sphere, which potentially is huge, um, but it's quite difficult to tap into. So we're going to start with Caleb from Finance Earth, who's going to talk about uh, the opportunities for private financing. Thanks, Rob, and um, hi, everyone. Lovely to see you. I, last time I had an after-lunch slot, I had two active sleepers, so I'm hoping I can be a bit more entertaining today. Um, also, apologies for the stretch slides. That's on me. I provided them in the wrong format. Um, this is our disclaimer. I don't have time to go through it, I'm afraid. If you have any questions on it, please let me know. Um, 
So, uh, first off, a little bit about Finance Earth. Um, some of you may know who we are, but very, very quickly, we are a, a corporate finance advisor and fund manager regulated by the FCA um, with the stated mission of um, uh, channeling, channeling private finance into the restoration and protection of nature. What does that actually mean? Um, well, I like to think of what we do as a, a spectrum of activity. So, um, uh, at one end, we've got our investment advisory uh, function, which is helping organizations to understand uh, and tap into private markets, um, and actually fundamentally aiming to, to receive private investment. Um, and then based on the strength of, of, of those, uh, those projects, um, we actually are also able to uh, raise and uh, uh, deploy funds um, from big kind of private, private capital markets. So um, the mo one that's most of note is UK Nature Impact Fund, which is uh, we're currently raising with Federated Hermes. Um, uh, we're targeting uh, 500 um, uh, billion pounds. No, 500 million pounds, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 500 million pounds uh, for, for investment in uh, nature across the, in, in the UK, uh, which includes an allocation for peatland restoration. Um, the box at the bottom you'll see uh, is what we call market building. Now, um, because we're focused on private finance, obviously the big thing there is markets. Um, and markets require what we call market infrastructure. Um, so that's the right kind of policies, grant schemes, um, uh, codes, that kind of thing, in order to have high integrity functioning markets that work for private finance. That's enough about us. Today, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the benefits and income streams of peatland restoration. Um, hopefully not too long on this. Um, a bit about where, the, where these are in terms of maturity, in terms of markets. Um, and they're going to talk a bit about um, uh, focusing, focusing in on carbon, um, uh, a bit about the, the, some of the risks and, and, and um, uh, benefits of, of taking a PIU sales approach versus a, a, a VCU sales approach. Um, so benefits and income streams. I think we've heard quite a lot about this already today, some of the, like the, the, the real benefits of peatland restoration, and you're all experts on this much more than I am. Um, but I think the reason that I've put, put this up here is, is to focus on these, and, uh, these benefits as markets. So um, the first one and, and, and the biggest one uh, is, is obviously carbon. Um, and the crucial thing here is that you need buyers, right? For order to, in order to have a market, you need demand. Um, and so the buyers for, for the carbon is going to be corporates. Uh, crop sales and polluter culture we've heard a lot about. Lots of great stuff going on from DEFRA there. Um, uh, sphagnum, um, typha. Um, and also we heard about Willow this morning. So lots of, lots of potential there for, um, for polluter culture, and that's a, a really burgeoning, um, burgeoning market there. Um, classic off-takers, I'm not going to mention the C word, compost. Um, but textiles, biopuff, um, was referenced by, I think, the Undersecretary of State this morning, um, uh, and also in construction. Uh, again, water quality benefits um, uh, and nutrients, if you're lucky enough to, or unlucky enough, depending on your view, to be in a, in a nutrient neutrality area, um, within the UK, there is actually a potential uh, additional market open for, for peatland restoration because you might be able to get developers to pay for the nutrient benefits um, uh, within your, your catchment um, or water companies uh, kind of more broadly. Um, and then this bottom one, biodiversity. So we've, we've talked a bit about um, uh, biodiversity benefits today, but from a market perspective, I think there's, there's sort of two. So in England, there's the um, new, new biodiversity net gain market. Um, uh, which unfortunately has been delayed to be implemented until January, but we are already seeing some transactions taking place ahead of, uh, ahead of legislation. Um, but there's also voluntary biodiversity credits, um, which is a, which is a, a developing uh, market in the UK um, and internationally as well. This is not meant to be exhaustive. There's obviously natural flood management and, and various other different um, markets that are, uh, that are also benefits from peatland restoration, um, but I thought I wanted to kind of call these out as the, uh, as the main ones. So what about market development? So we have a five-step uh, framework that we've developed um, to kind of show how natural capital markets can develop over time. So we start off here um, with number one um, with, oh, I've got a laser, number one here um, with technical proving. Um, and that is about understanding what the science is um, behind the outcomes and guaranteeing or having some sort of good scientific grounding um, of what the outcomes are and proving them. Um, then once you've uh, got a, a, an agreed understanding of what those outcomes are, you can move on to monetization. So monetization um, is about creating cash flows. You understand what the benefits are. You may be, you've found a, a buyer for those benefits. You can then sell those benefits to the buyer, creating a cash flow. And when you've got a cash flow, you can then move into what we call investment readiness. Now, investment readiness 
um, is about developing um, projects so they are ready to receive external private investment. It's about proving those revenue streams that you've created in monetization over and over again in order to provide confidence to any external investors that you'll be able to um, repay them. Uh, by the way, I think we are aiming for capital investment for all of these things. That is private, return-seeking, repayable finance. Because without that, we won't be able to fill the, on average, 6.1 billion pound funding gap in the UK uh, over the next 10 years. Um, so that's kind of what we're moving towards. I appreciate there's a lot of different ways of funding individual projects along, along the route. Um, but I think capital investment is, is kind of the goal here, uh, where it's appropriate, of course. Anyway, back to investment readiness. So you've, got, you've um, executed maybe one or two investments, um, and then it's time to scale up. Um, that's what we're, we've uh, entitled Pathfinder funding. Um, uh, and once you've kind of executed one investment, it becomes much easier to execute the next and the next and the next because the evidence is there. The investor is less worried about their money. And then finally, once you've scaled, you might be able to become a mainstream asset class um, uh, as a market. And so uh, access those larger pools of capital and really kind of scale up uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more meaningful way. Um, peel and restoration in this case, but any market on here. Um, it's worth noting that not all of these markets will reach capital investment. Not all of these markets will be appropriate for capital investment. Um, but we're kind of pushing towards, uh, towards that. Now, you've, um, you may notice that upland peat and lowland peat are at uh, different stages on this journey. There's two reasons for that. First is simply upland peat has been part of the peatland code for longer. Um, and so there is more evidence uh, investors are less worried about their investment because it's a better known market. Um, and there's also, uh, and then lowland peat also, there's a, uh, it, our experience thus far has been, tends, it tends to be um, a higher cost base for lowland peat um, due to uh, land prices and also ongoing pumping costs, um, which at current carbon prices um, doesn't account for the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uplift in, in carbon that you get from, from lowland peat as compared to upland peat. So that's kind of where we are. I'm going to focus on carbon for the last slide, um, where we've taken a bit, we've done a bit of thinking around pending issuance units uh, and um, uh, verified carbon units or peatland carbon units. Um, now, pending issuance unit is um, something that's issued in, in the early stages of the project. Um, uh, and uh, to, to call out some of the benefits and risks of, of pending issuance units as opposed to verified carbon units, which are once they've been verified. Um, we've uh, assumed here that a, a PIU funding um, approach uh, is based on selling 100% of your units up front um, as PIUs and then having no, no units for the rest of the project. Obviously, that's not necessarily the case, but it helps us kind of understand some of the risks and benefits. So, selling PIUs up front. Um, so, one of the benefits there is it removes any requirement for project financing. You have, presumably, if you're, if you're looking at using the Peatland Code to, um, uh, to verify carbon on your, on your project, um, you will have at least a 15% um, uh, cost shortfall from any grant scheme. So, um, you need to fill that somehow. And it's, it's a simple way of doing it. You sell your units up front, um, uh, and it's, it's a sale of goods for cash, which you can then use to restore uh, restore peatland. Uh, and also, the, that second benefit there is avoiding exposure to the future market downside. What that means is um, uh, if, uh, if carbon prices decrease, you're insulated from that because you've sold all of your PIUs uh, in year zero. However, there are a number of risks. Um, as you can see here, on the uh, uh, we've kind of split them into four main ones. Um, so the first one is around increased potential for uh, environmental harm. Um, now, we have seen in the market some buyers not understanding or purposefully, it's unclear exactly what happened, um, but claiming PIUs as offsets, um, which obviously is not accurate. The carbon has not been verified to have uh, been avoided to be admitted. So um, that in itself is, is kind of uh, a, a, an increased potential for environmental harm. Um, there's also a financial risk from a, from a project perspective. Um, so these projects take you know, 60, 70, 100 years in some cases. Forecasting across that time period, as I'm sure you all know, is very difficult, um, and forecasting accurately even more difficult. So if, a pro if you've sold all your PIUs up front, um, you have no ability in the future years of the project to uh, realize any additional income. And so um, uh, if there are any unforeseen costs, such as inflation we've got here, or if there are additional works that need to take place, you have no ability to realize additional income, and that funding has to be sought from elsewhere. 
The third one here is around market risk. So this is about the amount of, of cash flowing into the project. Um, so the first one is around market upside. Um, I think there is a McKinsey report that suggests that demand for voluntary carbon units is going to increase by up to 100-fold between 2020 and 2050, um, which suggests that the uh, long-term view for carbon prices is pretty positive. However, if you sold all of your PIUs in, um, uh, in year zero, then you don't have an opportunity to benefit from that. The, that's the kind of the flip side of the benefit avoiding exposure to the future market downside. Um, the other thing that we see around market risk is the verif verification premium. Now, um, typically we're seeing verified carbon going for between 30 and 100% on top of um, what uh, PIU prices are at the moment. Um, so by selling PIUs, obviously you don't, you don't have access to that. This last one's an interesting one, increased reputational risk. Now, we're assuming that project developers for this, for this particular risk are um, interested in, um, uh, help it, in, in driving good behavior in the voluntary carbon market through who they choose to sell to. So um, in, a PIU, oh, well, in a VCU situation, a verified carbon situation, you make that um, decision of, uh, around the buyer based on when you sell them the carbon, and you have the ability to, sell, to essentially retire that carbon on their behalf. Um, so they can use that to offset their claims, uh, offset their residual emissions, sorry. Um, but with, if you take a PIU approach, um, there's kind of two, two additional impacts for that. One is a, um, an increased time period for buyers to act negatively. Maybe you've done your due diligence, you um, sell them the PIUs, and then in 10 years' time, they, I don't know, go and chop down the swathes of the Amazon, for example. Like, there's nothing or very little, only contractual mechanisms can kind of can bring you back from that. Um, uh, and then there's uh, also an increased chance that they're going to sell those PIUs to other organizations. There are, there are contractual mechanisms, like I say, to, to kind of try and counteract some of this, but potentially over such long time periods especially, um, that can lead to pretty, pretty significant um, administrative burdens. So I'm going to leave you with um, a one more thought. Apologies. <laughs> um, I think there are three potential ways you, you might want to, if you want to avoid using PIUs, um, uh, as a major funding source. But I think there are three ways you can, you can think about funding projects. The first is obviously not selling all of your PIUs up front, is doing a bit more of a mix, um, and that will mitigate some of these risks, um, perhaps not completely, but it, at least partially. The second um, is to enter into longer term uh, agreements with off takers, so corporates who are looking to, um, looking to uh, offset their carbon emissions. Um, and uh, maybe you can access some of that income up front but still only release the carbon once it's been verified, you then avoid a lot of these risks. And the third one is um, actually engaging with private finance. And so trying to find investors that will invest in your carbon project, in your peatland restoration project, as a carbon project that will make them money. Um, but as a result, you can then repay that investor with the sale of, of verified carbon over time. And you can oh yeah, avoid, avoid all these things. I'm way over, so I'm going to stop there. But if you want any more, if you have any more, any more questions, we'll be here uh, for questions at the end. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Caleb. That was fantastic. It's a great introduction to the world of private finance. It's not that straightforward. Got you. And, um, and there's a lot of reference to the Peatland Code here, as there should be, because it's a great scheme. But the, the code is actually very complicated. I've recently come to the code. It's very complicated to develop, and it's very complicated because it's a very high integrity code. So it's hard to develop that integrity, and it's hard to maintain that link through to government and get it back by government, because it's got to be done. That means it can be hard to use for exactly the same reasons. It's a very high integrity code. But I'm not the expert on this, so we'll bring in the experts. So we're going to bring in two, actually. So we're going to bring in Rene Kirkvliet Hermans, I've probably pronounced that wrong, and uh, Chris Evans, which is a lot easier to pronounce, uh, who are the, the code authors. So welcome to the stage. Okay, thank you, and um, good afternoon already. Um, so yeah, I'm Rene Kirkvliet Hermans, and I'm the Peatland Code Coordinator for the IUCN UK Peatland Programme. So, I am just going to start, give you a brief introduction of what the Peatland Code actually is, and then Chris is going to talk about the actual science behind that. She actually say, so we're talking about applying the science, how the UK greenhouse gas inventory actually drives, um, in, uh, drives Peatland Code. So just very, very briefly, so the Peatland Code 
is there to get that private finance, that private investment into peatland restoration. And why is that needed? It is needed because we've got this funding commitment gap. So it's been, it's been estimated um, at about £560 million. Pounds. I know there's some um, people say that should, that's probably a bit lower, but we know there is, there is a commitment gap. So just um, to have that very clear. And we know we've got about 80% of our, all our peatlands are in a damaged state. So they are actually emitting more carbon and all our forests are sequestering every year. So it's a massive issue um, that we should, should um, tackle and restore as soon as we can. So that's where the Peatland Code comes in. So the Peatland Code is a UK government-backed um, domestic voluntary carbon market standard. And it's really there for landowners with eligible peatland, damaged peatland, I have to say. Um, if they follow our standards, they can get carbon credits to then sell on and get um, the private investment into the peatland restoration. And the peatland code is also really there to provide those assurances to the buyers, because like Halep just said, without the buyers, we don't get any investment into this. Um, we are talking about carbon, but I've got a very exciting announcement, very um, hot off the press. So we have actually secured some funds funding, so that's a Scots government funding. Um, together with the Woodland Carbon Code to look at biodiversity, voluntary biodiversity crediting as well. So look out for uh, a job advert. It's coming out this week, hopefully. Um, anybody interested, come and, and talk to us. Um, but yeah, we are going to see if we can start quantifying the biodiversity uplifts as well for both Woodlands and Peatland Code projects um, and then potentially sell them stacked or keep them bundled. So just very, very briefly, so we now are at uh, 219 projects registered on the Peatland Code. Um, you can see they are mainly in Scotland, but the rest of the UK is catching up, so hopefully we get more projects um, uh, in all, all four countries. That graph at the bottom, I'll just highlight that quickly, so that shows you the uplift and the increase in projects. So it is really taking off. So in July this year, we registered our 200 projects. And only the July last year, we registered a 100, so we doubled in a year's time. Um, so that's great, but we need to aim more. So a little bit on the development. So um, the Peatland Code was launched in 2015. I'm not going to talk about all of these, but the big highlight is at the start of this year, we um, launched version two of the Peatland Code. So initially, it was all about the uplands and bulks, because that's where we had the evidence and where we had enough um, scientific backing to start. Um, but we now have enough evidence to also have the lowlands included. Um, so we're very, very happy about that. We've also done emission factors updates, and that's where Chris will talk a bit in a second. And just briefly, like Rob touched on the complexity of the code. So this shows you just the really key bits that we have in place to, to ensure that robustness and the, um, hopefully the buyer's trust. So we've got the independent governance We've got permanent risk buffers in place. We've got additionality checks to make sure how the projects are over and above what would have happened without the carbon project. We've got independent validation and verification in place. We've got a transparent registry that's hosted by SP Global, and also all our carbon um, um, calculators are available online. And then lastly, what we're talking about today is we've got really robust science that's aligned with the UK Green and Gas Inventory. As my last slide, I'm just really briefly touching on the types of carbon units. Caleb has just talked about it. So pending estrogen units are kind of a promise or an expected emission reduction over the whole project timeline. A company cannot put an offset claim on that until it's actually verified. Um, and one PIU is one ton of CO2 um, equivalence saved. Um, so it actively reduced from, from the peatland. And then PCUs have verified um, equivalent of that. So we do verification throughout the whole projects, so independent verification throughout the whole lifetime of those projects to check that they're actually still in that good condition. So I just wanted to highlight that because that one ton is really crucial because that's where the scientific backing comes from. And I'll, I'll hand over to Chris for that bit. Okay, thank you. Um... So as Rob said, you've had three brilliant speakers this afternoon, and now you've got me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm going to sneak some science into a funding session. Um, but I, I mean, for good reason, because as anyone who's followed what happened with Vera in the last year or so will have noticed, if you start flogging carbon credits that aren't credible, 
uh, your business model unravels pretty fast and the things you would like to do don't happen. So I guess our role, and, and by us I mean the kind of whole science community, is, is to sort of support what's going on with the Peatland Code and, and other initiatives that are, are trying to sort of these restoration and mitigation and so on. So a piece of work we did, seems a while ago now, but um, published at the start of this year, um, which was really about updating the emission factors and bringing them into line with what's in the UK's national emissions inventory, because the two had sort of evolved in parallel. So potentially you were claiming one set of numbers with the Peatland Code that didn't match up with what was in the inventory. And that wasn't intentional, it was just what had happened. Um, I would like to say it's a group effort, and particularly Rebecca Arts and James Hutton had a huge input to doing this work, so um, just to mention that. So what we did, we collated all the latest evidence. We're still following this categorical approach, which you'll have probably seen before. It's not everything we'd like it to be, but we're constrained by the art of the possible a bit. Um, and this is what's in the UK's inventory, so we're trying to follow that. Um, added a few more categories, but it is still category-based. Um, and... Yeah, still struggling to separate some categories because the data just aren't there. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about why in a bit. But um, this, is some, this is kind of where we've ended up going for FENS, Pete. Um, I quite like us to go there with all Pete, really. But um, we've got pretty good data from the Flux Tower Network, which my colleague Ross oversees. Um, this was how it looked a few years ago for a paper. Uh, this is more dots being added, mostly for lowland, cropland, and grassland systems. But basically, they sit on a kind of a line. Um, the deeper you drain, the more emissions you get. Who would have guessed? Um, there is a flip side, which is the methane, but it only really starts to kick in when you get really wet. Um, so if you add those two together, there's unquestionably mitigation benefits from raising water levels across most of that spectrum. Um, so basically, these relationships, we've, I'll show you in a second, but um, before I do, just to say that we might be bending this a little bit now as we get more data, and I think Ross is going to talk about the latest data on Thursday, if you're interested. Um, and we're still building this all the time. Um, so this is what's in there for FENS. It's using that relationship, so you say, what's your baseline water table, data, water table depth across your site um, at the start, what happens afterwards, and then you can work out what the different, you know, or what you expect to happen, and you can work out the the differential and therefore the, the emission saving. And in terms of re results-based payments, it's, it's probably quite a good way to go for these systems. And there's no real reason why it wouldn't work for others as well, except that I think when the project developers were asked, they weren't desperately keen to go out and measure water levels everywhere. Um, don't know why not, it's quite interesting. Um, <laughs> so continuing evidence needs, I should skip through this or run out of time. Um, we always say this, but we do need more data because if you think about how many categories we've got, how much variation there is out in the real world. This is the Flux Tower Network about a year ago. There's a few more. These aren't all on peat. Where they are on peat, um, around here especially, they, they've proliferated around here. Um, and that's because of, well, firstly, what Indra was showing earlier with the emissions being a hot spot, and, and that's where the policy questions were. But actually, with a Uplands have sort of fallen behind a bit. We still can't really split heather dominated from grass dominated bog, which is a shame. Um, and we'd like paired before after intervention studies. Um, this is a personal interest of mine because we've got a project on it. But at the moment, we're recognizing the benefits of emissions reductions from restoration. Uh, we're not capturing the fact that if you restore well, actually, you've got a carbon sink. And peatlands are the best carbon capture and storage systems on, in the terrestrial ecosystem, at least, unless you want to wait for cold to form. Um, which comes from Pete anyway. Um, so we're not doing that. Um, There's for good reasons. Um, but nevertheless, we think that might be missing something. So this are, these are real data, those red dots, and then a simple model fitted for how much carbon capture you get as you restore a site. And it's quite a lot above the natural peat accumulation rate. And actually, we think if you um, mess with the system a bit by active carbon farming, you could move it way up. Um, so this is an example for what we think we'd get with miscanthus, which is this stuff, just to annoy Richard Lindsay. Um, but this is a real farmland. This is as far as they could get the water levels. That's the bull, that's the typha there. It's just been killed by weeds. Phragmites is doing okay. There's some willow growing like crazy at the back, but at the moment it's thin stems, and this, this miscanthus is growing like the clappers. Um, that's a lot of carbon. If you could get that carbon into the system, you've got a carbon sink. Um, and then very, very quickly, because Clifton will glare at me, um, MRV is absolutely crucial for all of this. If you can't demonstrate an outcome, you've got a problem. Really, I think that's where all this kind of stuff with Vera's kicked off, really. Um, 
and the rules are getting tighter, and if people are going to invest in this, they want to see the outcome. And they want it kind of cheaply. They don't want to go out and put a flux tower out, that's for sure. Uh, so that's actually a lot of what we're doing now, is, is trying to come up with sort of smart ways of both monitoring things on the ground, using these guys, peak cameras, to look at ground motion and then linking that to satellite data. Um, something like that. It's pretty cool. You can see that's the site in Wales. NRW rewetted it. It just jumped. The peak surface jumped straight off um, when it was rewetted, so that tells you it worked. Um, and it's frozen. Why is it frozen? There we are. Uh, final slide, I think. Um, just to show, if, if you want to do this at scale, you need to be able to do it with satellites, really, and there's lots of people trying to do this. This is just some examples that from work by Jenny Williamson, who's also here. Um, this is using Sentinel-1, which is the radar, free radar data uh, to classify peatlands. That's the Mignite area there. It's doing a really good job. It's picking up the ditched areas. It's picking up the natural areas. It's picking up the rewetted areas. And this is something she sent me last week. I think I sent her a one-line response saying, wow, but this is um, Sentinel-1 modeled water levels versus observed water levels for a rose bog in Wales, and it's actually working. This is kind of the holy grail, <laughs> I think, if you want to be able to remotely measure whether you successfully restored your peatland. So, don't know if it will work anywhere else, but it's a good start. And that's it. Thank you. Well, look, thank you very much. We're talking about sustainable financing, you know, so we're in a world where peatlands were generally managed for sheep farming, deer stalking, grouse shooting, arable crops even, vegetables, maybe a bit of tourism. We sometimes talk about polluter culture, all generating revenues, potentially, um, from peatlands. We move into a world of grants for restoration, peatland action, peace plan, nature and climate fund. We've talked quite a lot of those this morning. And then you go into the whole world of agri-environment. We've come out of Europe, but we had a fantastic example of the common agricultural policy appearing to be used actually quite well, which was a, well, it seems like a bit of a miracle, given my experience of the cap in how it was applied in the UK. And obviously we had the Brexit dividend of our removal from the common agricultural policy. So we have ELM, the Scottish Sustainable, well, the Welsh Sustainable Land Use Scheme, and so on, and the farming with nature in, in, Northern, Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and so on. And then this new world of private financing, carbon, nutrient, biodiversity, the importance of the Peatland Code, nutrient neutrality, biodiversity, net gain. There's a mass of complexity in and around all of that, but fundamentally we need to get 100% of our peatlands restored in some way to bring that stop those carbon emissions going to the atmosphere and then maintain that system in good fettle for many many years to come so there's a bit of background to this session and i very much welcome questions and we'll start with the gentleman at the back there from the glass back on. yeah thank you very much i'm um, joe from Beda moss um, i thought that last bit of research chris that you're doing really really interesting around greenhouse gases i come from a perspective Peatland restoration is all about climate change, and you're going to get the biodiversity and the ecosystem benefits from that. From the work that you did, did you see a difference between re-wetting only versus also revegetation in terms of methane and also in, in terms of CO2? Uh, ooh, um, almost certainly yes, whether I could say that definitively. I mean, if you want... Uh, carbon sequestering system, ultimately you need peat forming vegetation on there of some description, whether that's the natural species that should be there or whether you're actually farming for biomass. Um, methane's a tricky one because it, it, it really depends on so many things and, it, and certain species. I, I think it's something to bear in mind because there's a lot of typha being grown <laughs> uh, in polluter culture trials and not many methane measurements being made on those, but actually that's quite a good species at funneling methane from very wet conditions to the atmosphere. So I think we need to have that in mind that for all these things, and actually sphagnum is, is a good one at doing the opposite. It's a good one at keeping the methane, well, stopping the methane getting out. So yeah, that's not a very straight answer. I think it's a really important issue actually as, as to what, what your end point is and what that really means. And, and you know, so it is results based rather than sort of hope based. Which reminds me of a story. If you want to get rid of watercolour from um, peaty catchments, get rid of the peat bog. Yeah, but of course we don't want to do that. <laughs> of course we don't want to do that. You know, <laughs> actually we're, 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 we're restoring peatlands for multiple outcomes, not yeah. just carbon. So we must remember that as we go forward in the carbon story. But this, I mean, but this is all important, of course, the peatland code. But I just make that story. Quote clear. You on that. Anyway, next question. <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, Philip Strait and Morse of the Future. Um, question for um, the, the Peatland Code. We're starting to um, run into difficulties with landowners um, who are holding off of doing restoration works in the hope that they will make more money in the future, leaving us with degraded land that we can't do anything with. We're also seeing difficulties where we have secured funding from a private source and there are now discussions between the landowners and the private funders as to who gets what from the carbon code. So how do we see this in the future, please? Thanks, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so farmers holding off because they think they can get a higher price in the future, I would say restore now because you don't have to sell your units. Like the, there are other mechanisms. You can get some public funding to help with the actual restoration costs. Um, there are other finance options to, if, there, if there's still a gap that needs to be plucked. But you don't have to sell all your PAUs. You might just sell a, a proportion and then hold on to the rest and you can wait for that higher price if that's, if that's what they want to do. We don't know if the price actually will be there, just to caveat that, it might not happen. Um, on the other question about how you actually do the negotiations between a, a buyer and, and, uh, and a landowner, well, it's early days, it's a, it's a very early market, so I don't have very specific Things that I can tell you, the only thing is if you if you are want if they're wanting to do a PIU deal and they might and the landowner might be worried that they get like too little for their carbon, there, there are options of potentially looking at, at um, like the uplift sharing later on. Um, but I think Caleb is probably way better um, situated to, to help me with that one. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, look, <clears throat> contracts can be pretty flexible, right? You can get a contract to do anything. I think. The, difficult, the difficulty, as long as both parties, or all parties agree, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, I think the difficulty comes in the implementation. So um, you know, if, if you're thinking about some sort of um, profit sharing agreement between a private buyer and a landowner, you, know, you, need to, you need to think about all potential eventualities and maybe that's something, um, maybe the, the, the buyer will want to sell on pending issuance units, and that's you know, one of the risks that, we, that, I, that I talked about um, uh, a moment ago. So um, it, it can be very complex, um, and we're trying to aim for kind of simplicity um, uh, and uh, to help. I think I'm very aware that I work for an organization that helps attract private finance into nature, and I'm saying that part of the solution is private finance. So I, 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 I want to kind of caveat what I'm about to say with, with it's not the only thing, only tool in the box. But um, if you were to engage with private finance, there are definite ways that, you're, uh, that you can kind of tie, tie in any future uplift with uh, a, an investor, um, uh, uplift in carbon price, while also insulating, as a landowner, insulating yourself from, um, from future downside. Um, certainly investors will be, should be open to that um, for the right project. Okay, can I just ask a supplementary on there? on how effective you think the carbon markets are working. So I think we've done some research looking at um, the price that carbon is selling from PIUs, I think, through the code. And it's really low. It's like 20, what is it, 25 something, something like that, okay. which costs, I mean, that's nothing in comparison to what it should be selling at, and certainly nothing to the relation to the cost of restoration. And it struck me, well, it's not too surprising. Firstly, you're selling PIUs, not verified carbon units, which must be less. Secondly, it's a subsidised marketplace because the grants to do the restoration is being provided by the states and then the onward maintenance is, can be subsidised through ELM. So are we seeing a... a, a in, in a, how do we address those issues around ineffective marketplace? I mean, is it, does this marketplace really exist? Is, I guess what I'm asking. Great question. Um, yes, it does. Um, but it is a very nascent market. So um, in order for the market to get going, if you remember back to my slide with the three circles on the bit at the bottom, the market infrastructure, part of that market infrastructure is grant schemes, which you've alluded to just now. That's actually crucial to getting um, any market going, um, uh, especially a market like, like carbon, where the, you know, the costs are quite high. And um, yeah, it, so it's, it, it definitely is um, something that we're hoping will happen with, is the, the um, price of carbon will increase. I think the government has set the social cost of carbon at something like 235-ish pounds, something like that. Um, that feels like a, I mean, you've, at, at current restoration 
a maintenance prices, and you'd be able to make a, a, a fair profit off that. But um, obviously, we are seeing these these lower prices because um, the regulatory drivers as well, you know, T, TCFD um, uh, it is only really kind of coming into force now. Um, but I refer back to that um, to that McKinsey report. You know, the likelihood of uh, well, the upper, their upper limit was 100, 100 to times what we had in 2020 for the voluntary carbon market. So, um, yeah, that I think uh, speaks, speaks for itself, really. So if you're doing restoration, hold on to those carbon code credits because they're going to be worth a fortune in the future. <laughs> right, Possibly. next question. I was going to uh, say that. Possibly. <laughs> Stuart. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, so I just wanted to, I, I guess, expose another risk um, and see... Caleb in particular, whether you've got any response to this. So the challenge that was set out this morning around kind of upscaling the, of the ambition of the restoration, so let's follow that through with an assumption that there's going to be a significant increasing demand um, for uh, use of the code. Um, and Rene's already shown us we've had a 100% kind of increase in code activity, you know, this year compared to last year. So carry on on that trajectory. So there's a huge risk at the moment because the code is quite fragile in its ability to scale up and, and meet that demand. So, I mean, this is just because of the nature of, of how it's funded um, and, and how it's supported and the governance around it. So are there other examples of other finance markets, if you like, that have this type of dependency? And what would you suggest might be a, a kind of more robust model, I suppose, um, for the code. So just to confirm, you're, you're asking about the code itself, not the kind of broader infrastructure of organizations. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I, uh, I think, well, let's take the voluntary, um, the biodiversity net gain market, um, uh, where the government has essentially developed the Deferometric 4.0, um, and it's kind of in legislation. That's basically making a compliance market. Interestingly, we're seeing alongside that um, transactions taking place using the same metric, but in the voluntary market. So um, I think if the code is there and it can be used, um, I think the IUCN team is doing excellently. I'm not quite sure <laughs> what these uh, f uh, fragilities are, but um, uh, I'm, sh I'm uh, yeah, I think it would be... Um, it's a, yeah, that's that's a good a good example as a, of, of another market that that can that has scaled given the infrastructure. Um, I'm not sure if there's a specific area that you're that you're thinking of uh, of of talking about if, you are, if they're asking about. Well, well I mean, maybe I'm just taking the opportunity to let the community know um, <laughs> that we need to be thinking about you know the kind of future governance really and and ownership uh, and support for the code. I mean. It's been developed really on the back of a whole range of um, project funding. Um, and obviously the ICN UK Peatland program is, is a funded project in itself. So you know, that's largely funded at the moment by Esme Fairburn. Um, so that gives you an idea about the actual fragility of the infrastructure which is supporting uh, the Peatland code. So yeah. I'll just rest that with the community, really. Because it's a it's it's a collective challenge I think, that we've got. I think also worth mentioning in this in this market, um, as I'm sure everyone here will will be painfully aware of, is the capacity of this sector to actually get on and, and deliver the restoration on the ground is is another challenge that sort of runs in parallel in my mind. Um, so yeah, we're again looking for investment opportunities there as well, but um, it's uh, yeah an, an, another challenge certainly that's, that's similar. Okay, we've got a question right at the back, I think. It's a question for Gary. Um, are the farmers happy with the scheme that they went through? And are they happy with the amount of farming they can still do? And I wondered if any of the four UK nations had sent people over to see how your scheme's working, because it sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, farmers... Farmers in general are happy. I mean, it's um, it's a low risk for the farmers. They're, it's completely voluntary. Well, our pilot scheme, for example, if we if we start there, it's it's a voluntary scheme. The farmer signs up. 
what he signs or she signs up for is that they will give us access to their land parcel data so we can verify they own the land they say they own and they will turn up to one day's training so they learn how to use the scorecard and do an assessment of their own farm, the ecological condition, they know what the payments are about. Um, apart from that, it's, it's entirely voluntary. We work with the farmer's farm advisor who will score the, the land for their client. Um, they get a score of between zero and 10 on every single field and you know they get an accumulative payment related to that. Um, they don't have to do anything about that after that, so it's, you know, it's money for the ecological condition on that given day that it's scored. Um, if they want to do something about that, then we're there with financial and technical support to help them to improve the environmental condition. If they don't want to do anything about it, that's their own business as well. So we never ask them what type of farm enterprise they have, how many sheep they have, how many cattle they have. They can, you know, they can farm away as they wish but if there's damage on the ground, it'll be picked up with a scorecard and they'll not get a payment. If they're delivering good environmental quality, they will get a payment. So it makes sense for the farmer. It get, they retain the flexibility to farm as they wish. What it does essentially is it opens up a new market for these ecosystem services. So your carbon, water, biodiversity, and depending on prices of livestock or whatever, the farmer can target some years, you know, reduction in fertilizer use, I'll try and get a higher environmental payment. Sheep prices go high, they might go after, you know, sheep numbers, whatever it may be. They can make that business decision themselves on, based on a cost benefit, input output, whatever model um, that's there. So, so there, is, um, there is a lot of support, I would say, also the fact that we look to bring in non-common agriculture policy money to deliver the larger restoration projects as well. So the farming community, farm organizations are very supportive of any non new, new money into the system that's going towards farmers, I would say. Um, the state are also happy to pay for that because we can improve the condition of our, our special areas of conservation, et cetera, keep, keep Europe off our backs for delivering our, our obligations. And we're looking at, de at developing this private finance, blended finance model as well, where we've got, you know, philanthropists, corporates coming in funding funding projects as well. So there's a lot. There's a lot. Again, more money for farmers to see the opportunity. So there's a lot. There's a lot there, and it kind of, for now, it makes sense for the farmers. Um, now that we're gone to 20,000 farmers through the Common Agricultural Policy. The day they get their checks, their payments out, um, there'll be chaos because some of them will be absolutely disgusted at what they got. Some of them will be, will be delighted. Uh, one issue there is there's a cap on payments, so the maximum they'll get is 7,000, but they, they kind of tend to, you know, you get loads of phone calls saying, oh, what's going on here? I got a low score, blah, blah, blah. And then they settle down after a few days and they'll say, right, what can I do about it? Right, I've, you know, they've had a look around, they can see, ah, oh, I see now what the issue is, yeah, right, and then they'll kind of go at the restoration. So, so yes, farmers happy, it makes sense for them. One, one the biggest change, I guess, it's an agri-environment scheme that's designed to deliver for the environment, probably for the first time. All the mainstream schemes up to this were designed to deliver soft money for the farmer, to put it, put it frankly, you know. Um, and we've had several groups from, from the UK and Northern Ireland. I see Jennifer there, we work with Jennifer, we've seen, has been down a few times. Um, we've had the Life Pennine Peat Project or some over, we've had Richard Grace, is Richard here? I thought I saw his name somewhere. Yeah, we've had, we've had several. We work on the shared island that Dave mentioned earlier, we coordinate that 20 million project ourselves with Northern Ireland Environment Agency and Nature Scott, so we're looking at learning about the peatland code from Nature Scott, uh, exchange of knowledge about agri-environment schemes, the other direction, and testing in, in real-world restoration projects as well. We're on waterlands, as somebody mentioned earlier. So there's lots of collaboration going on, and there is lo a lot of people coming to visit. It's really interesting stuff, all this, isn't it? Because you can start to see a potential model how you make all of this work, you know? So it's fine to say, I would say, like, why are we growing carrots in peat in the fence? Well, we're growing carrots in peat and fence because it's profitable. And peat and restoration hasn't been profitable. So how do we make it profitable? And you can start, to, you can begin to see a model emerging from this discussion where we use grants to restore that carrot field into a beautiful natural peatland. We use agri-environment payments and maybe peatland code payments and other payments to make that revenue scheme move forward. 
and then we can use things like tourism and so on and other activities on top to generate decent profit from that, that land. So we move the land from a, an, a liability to the state, i.e. it's a polluting system that's costing us a fortune to sort out, to an asset for the public and for that private farmer. That's a really interesting model and I think there's a lot to commend what's happening in Ireland there, I think. So it's a great, great example. Anyway, another question. You'll be pleased because it's a follow-up from what you were saying. So I'm Rob Wise with the National Farmers Union here in East Anglia, so working with lowland peat farmers, uh, particularly in the Fens, but also in the Broads. And my question was going to be to Jerry about uh, how you set payment rates for a government scheme like that, because obviously results-based payments, you're talking about the environmental result. And so quite often calculations are done around some notion of the ecosystem services value of that. And that may bear little or no relationship to the income foregone, especially if we come back to your example of carrots in the fens. So to make this scheme attractive to Irish farmers, how, have, how and where have you set payment rates in relation to the opportunity cost of the uh, farming change versus the actual value of the biodiversity and environmental gains that have been uh, delivered. Yeah, it, it, uh, well, you've, you've given partly given the answer there. The, we're bound by WTO rules, so the, the payment rates were set based, based on costs incurred and income forgone under WTO rules, but also based on the full cost of management. So our pilot ran under the last cycle of the Common Agricultural Policy, so we were paying on top of the Agri-Environment Scheme, which was called GLOSS, that the, the majority of the farmers were in at that time. So what, well, what you do in the results-based approach is you look at, well, what's the ideal landscape that I want here? What does a 10 out of a 10 look like in terms of you know, drainage and vegetation and everything else? And you say, what's, what's perfect condition? You give that 10. And then you say, well, what detracts from perfect condition? Then you start to add in all the things that, that make it of lower quality, and you weight them accordingly with different minus and pluses, et cetera. So our 10 out of 10 was based on the full cost of management for that land per, per hectare. What would it cost a farmer to bring the, it up to 10 out of 10? So it's based on WTO rules with a bit of a nuance and bringing in the full cost, cost of management there. So we didn't have a cap on, pay, on payments, but we are working in northwest of Ireland where it's you know, mostly upland sheep farmers and the average farm income is about 20,000 euros, which is over 100% of their income is coming from subsidies. So it's lo low income farming, entirely dependent on subsidies. Most of them are loss making enterprises. So we, we paid an average of about 3,000 euros per farmer, so when you're when your farm enterprise is generating 20,000 and you get 3,000 more, it's, it's a nice lift. You know, some farmers got over 10,000. If you're dealing with dairy farms or horticulture farms, it may be different. I mean, the average dairy farm income in Ireland is 140,000 or something. You come with two, 3,000 for those guys, for, forget about it, you know. So, so there's different challenges, challenges there, all right. But I think there are also solutions. But if you want farmers to deliver, for the environment in terms of water quality, biodiversity, over it, you've got to pay them accordingly. So they've got to, you know, they've got to, the money has to be found, has to be there to pay accordingly, or the farmers won't, won't play ball, and, and you wouldn't blame them, you know. It's Chris, do you want to come? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, I think that, I mean, the way you describe that, I mean, the, I can see how a sliding scale from 0 to 10 works in a, you know, in a, in a peatland with varying degrees of grazing intensity. I don't really see how it works if one end member's a carrot field and the other end member is a, is a wetland. Um, I think there's much more subjective decision making perhaps to make there and also where are the carrots going to come from. I mean, the, the, it, it gets a lot more complicated. I, I like the idea, definitely. I mean, the, but how you would implement it in this part of the world, I don't know. Maybe. And just to be provocative, and then I'm going to stop and just to leave this for <laughs> you. Give up using the income foregone calculation may change radically if you took into account the costs of pollution that farmers don't pay for. So that carbon has been, is a pollutant that's going to the atmosphere the water's been polluted, that has to be picked up by the public purse. And of course, there's the drainage of the fens, which is not mostly picked up by the public purse as well. So we just have to think about all of those as well. Anyway, I'm being deliberately provocative just for fun. So I'm going to bring that discussion to a close. And thank you very much. And a big round of applause.